Hello, this is Bill Levinson, and thank you for listening. The first part of the video discussed green and sustainable manufacturing in the language of money and cited the results achieved by Henry Ford back in the 1910s and 1920s, and that was during an era in which he could have legally thrown into the nearest river whatever wouldn't go up the smokestack. Now we're going to discuss the four R's, refuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle, and show that Henry Ford was in fact doing all those and how he achieved excellent results by doing it. The four R's are commonly used to describe green manufacturing. Refuse, that is, refuse to make the environmental waste, uh, reduce it, reuse it, and or recycle it. Four R's in order of preference, refuse, uh, in other words, refuse to make the waste or prevent it, reduce it if not possible to prevent it, reuse it if not possible to reduce it, and recycle as a last resort. We promised earlier to prove that this was in fact invented by Henry Ford uh, probably about 90 years ago at this point. Ford stated in his book Today and, and Tomorrow, uh, we will not so lightly waste material simply because we can reclaim it because salvage involves labor. The ideal is to have nothing to salvage. In other words, don't make the waste in the first place. Ford also wrote in Today and Tomorrow, uh, which was written in 1926, picking up and reclaiming the scrap left over after production is a public service, but planning so there will be no scrap is a higher public service. There you get into techniques like design for manufacturing, designing the part, for example, so you don't have to machine off a lot of metal and then have metal and cutting fluids lying around, but it's definitely shows here that Henry Ford developed the concept of refusing to make the waste in the first place. Here's an example of how manufacturing waste can hide in plain view. You have a machining operation here where somebody is making a part and most people would pay attention to the part because that's the product. You can also see there are a lot of swarf or metal chips which have to be sent back for recycling and Henry Ford would have looked at those metal chips and said, is there any way we can design this part or this process so we don't have to make so many chips along with, for example, whatever cutting fluids might be discarded along with them. As an example, at the River Rouge auto plant during the late 1920s or early 1930s, workers noticed that the machining process reduced 25% of the aluminum stock to chips and that bothered them immediately. They said, why are we wasting 25% of the aluminum, not even wasting it because it was recyclable, but turning it into chips. So they ended up redesigning the product or the process. The, the reference doesn't go into details, but it says it was redesigned to reduce the waste to 2%. That was how the Henry Ford thought process worked at the River Rouge plant. Henry Ford on reducing or refusing to make machining waste. Our objective is always to minimize the subsequent machining. There you get into design for manufacturing. Also, another thing Ford would do would be to assemble small parts together instead of casting and machining larger ones. That also cut down on the machining waste. More examples of refuse and reduce. They had a cross-shaped oil can holder. If it was stamped out of steel, it cost uh, 6.35 cents. Uh, by the way, 6.35 cents was a huge amount of money back then. I think you could buy a loaf of bread for about a nickel. But if they welded two pieces together, it cost 4.78 cents each. So there was a 24.7 cost reduction, little or no metal to recycle. Now here you see green, avoiding environmental waste, is entirely compatible with uh, profitability if you do it correctly. More on refuse and reduce. Uh, Ford said by changing the cutting tools and multiples and the length of the stock saved more than a million pounds of steel a year. What he means by changing the length of the stock, suppose you're making something that's uh, oh, 100 millimeters long, uh, the idea is you want to get the stock as maybe 101 or 102 millimeters to cut it to size, 
if you have to cut it the size as opposed to 120 millimeters cutting the end off and throwing all that metal away, it probably is even more applicable to woodworking operations where lumber or timber comes in specified sizes. It's better if you can get it in the same size as the part you're trying to make so you don't have all these ends you've cut off and then have nothing to do with them other than, say, throw them away or recycle them. Ford on reusing things. Uh, packaging was reused very frequently, and his strategy was to, if possible, send the package back for another load. Uh, that's returnable containers. Or make the packaging so it could be built into the product. There's a rumor to the effect that Ford had his supplier ship things in boxes with planks of very specific sizes. The planks could then be turned into floorboards for Model T automobiles. Another example, they were stamping a metal sheet with six inch diameter holes. Now the sheet was the product, but the uh, employee said immediately, what happened to the metal that was in those holes? The answer was it was sent back to the blast furnace to be recycled. However, the, the employees found that if they took two of those discs, they could press them together to make a radiator cap, so instead of throwing them back in the blast furnace, they started making radiator caps. That's an example of reusing. There's a saying, keep your eye on the donut and not on the hole. Actually, if you want to be effective at green manufacturing, it's a very good idea to keep an eye on the hole. If the donut is the product, the hole is what is thrown away in the process of making the product, and by paying attention to that, you can realize enormous savings. This includes paying attention to what goes up the smokestack. The quote is from Upton Sinclair's The Fliver King, says that Ford took the smoke that port once poured from his chimneys and made it into automobile parts. Now that's not exactly what happened, and we'll see what happened in a moment, but Ford did pay attention to what went up the smokestacks. We don't see how you could make smoke into automobile parts, but we've read that Henry Ford did capture solvent fumes from painting operations, and instead of burning them, or venting them to the atmosphere, he recovered them by absorption or adsorption into charcoal and then reused it. I think Ford was able to make each gallon of solvent work ten times before he ended up throwing it away because 90% was recovered each time. Uh, so each gallon did the work of ten gallons before it finally became unusable. Okay, recycling is the last resort. If anyone's used charcoal briquettes to have a backyard barbecue, such as Kingsford charcoal in particular, that's how Henry Ford got rid of the wood for which he could find no other possible use. A distillation of waste wood produced chemicals like methyl alcohol, uh, other chemicals, and sale of those chemicals brought in 12,000 a day, uh, and... That was enough to pay 2,000 workers $6 per day, which was actually a lot of money in that era. That was a very high hourly middle class wage back then. Slag from blast furnaces, instead of being thrown away, was sold as cement and paving material. So recycling was the last resort, but Ford did recycle. Okay, this is the end of part two. We've gone over the four R's. The next step is to recognize waste wherever it exists, and one of Ford's success secrets was to recognize waste that others overlook, and the next section will provide a universal working definition. Thank you for listening.